Okay, good morning guys. This is a quick uh, brief introduction. Welcome again to the South African Training Providers Forum. Uh, this is one of many webinars that uh, we try to, to schedule in the future. And today's webinar is, 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 is a total free webinar to our members. And we're going to talk today about material, buying material. Now, before I'm going to start, my name is Ezra Steenkamp. I'm the chairperson of the South African Training Providers uh, Forum. We are not, uh, NPC, a non-profit forum. And I have three very uh, welcome guest speakers. I've put out the word there and, and asked for people to please join in. And I've got these three ladies. I don't know where's the men, but I've got these three ladies have, who have joined and said they are more than willing to, to run this talkie block with us. Basically, people forward their questions to me and I'm going to ask it and I can decide who's going to answer. I can just quickly, if I can just say many thanks again for these three speakers. One of our speakers, unfortunately, had to cancel this morning, but I'm going to say many, many thanks for the three guest speakers today, you know, for your time, putting your time aside. I know February is a very crazy month. If I can just start briefly just with you, Linnell, if you can just quickly give us a, a a quick breakdown. Uh, who are you? What are you doing? What is your company name? Okay, Ezra, um, I'm Linnell Farrell. Uh, I am female because a lot of people think Linnell is Lionel, but it's actually Linnell. <laughs> um, I'm an independent consultant. I'm not a legal entity whatsoever. I am um, completely independent, so I work on my own. I am an assessor, a moderator, lead verifier, qualified paralegal. I am also um, in the industry for about 17 years. I've been evaluating learning material for about seven years. Um, so I don't develop, I don't have the time for it, but I actually evaluate learning material. And my main focus is QSTO applications, where I assist providers in applying and um, evaluating their whole package before they go through the site visit. So that's me. Uh, just one quick question, now 17 years and you're still not tired of it? No. <laughs> not yet. Not, not yet. yet. I haven't not given yet. up yet. Not yet. Welcome, Linnell. Many thanks. And uh, for, for the guys, we're also going to, also our, our three guest speakers, we're also going to post the contact details um, on the video. So the details will be available on the video on YouTube from tomorrow. Many thanks and welcome, Linnell. Janine. Thanks, Ez. Hi, everybody. My name is Janine Topping, and I'm with a company called JTNA. We're a team of eight. We've been assisting training providers, or SDPs, for over 11 years now with their accreditation. With all CETAs, when we started, there were 28, and now we're down to 21, as well as the QCTO. Um, our core focus is to actually capacity build providers. So we don't just put the file together. We actually teach them how to roll out their training when they get accredited. So that is our core focus. We don't develop material. We often refer our clients to material developers and you, those are not my favorite people. <laughs> so yes, um, it's going to be interesting to see what Linnell and Zelda and everyone else has got to say today. So thank you for inviting me, Ez. Welcome, Janine. Welcome. Again, oh, lots of years now. Um, and then there's quite interesting, Linnell and Janine. So you guys don't develop material. So you're from a different point of view. You deal with evaluation of learning material, you know, when it goes to the CETAs. Okay, that's got it. So you, you've, you've got experience with a lot of developers over the years, surely, that built up. Okay, welcome. It's quite interesting. And then we have Zelda. Okay, Zelda, we can't hear you. Just unmute you. Okay, Zelda. Right. Tell me that files at the back, is that all the programs that you've developed? No, it's not. <laughs> um, so my company is called GemTrain. Um, we've been, we've been, been in existence for 25 years. It's our 25th anniversary this year. 
Uh, I did two things. One is I am a training provider. And the second thing is I'm also a training material developer. So I've been developing materials since day one of having the training company. And I've been selling to other training providers since 1998. So been around for a long time, have lived through all the changes, have seen the seaters come and go and dissipate and all the differences in between them. And I work quite closely with um, people like Janine and Linnell who also do the accreditations because the capacity building of the actual uh, training provider is what is important. I can write all the material I want to in the world, but it's how do I deliver it to the training companies or the, or the skills development provider, you know, those big words. How do I give it to the training company in a format or a way that is user friendly? And I'm also there to support the, the training companies as they do their rollouts and their, their training starts. And you have know, a facilitator that really does not understand the subject. Um, I gladly will spend hours on the phone or hours on the meeting to help share and make sure that we do deliver the best training that's available. We don't like this negative talk about seated training or QCTO training. We like it to be a good thing. Zelda, um, uh, uh, welcome. I envy you, but to be quite honest, <laughs> material <laughs> developing is not my strong point. I I kick against it. It's it's not my forte. I, I envy the people who have the time to sit with it. That is not something that I like to do at all. Now, before we're going to start with, with, with my talking block, I also just want to say we have our WhatsApp groups where we talk. I have um, posted a lot of people, so we haven't selected uh, specific people to talk today. We actually put the advert out there. These three, another lady, Yolanda, also volunteered. So in the future, we will have more. So it's not, I just want to make it clear that we don't select certain people that the advert was out. And if there's more people in the future that wants to, that's a specialist in a certain area and want to be part of these talking blocks, you're more than welcome. Guys, now I've, I've you know, I've also a bit in the training industry and, and then it took me about 10 years. Then I discovered they talk about this thing about off the shelf and then special development um you know for us as training providers we we don't always and especially the new people who start at anyone that maybe want to explain to us quickly what what do you mean with off the shelf and special development what what is the differences between these things okay i'll go yes off, yeah off the shelf learning material is learning material that we have developed already it's sitting in a folder on my computer and it's available to the training provider to use immediately. It means that it already has all the parts required in the training material set and it's available right now. I don't have to do anything in order for you to be able to use it. Special development, two categories. One would be where I can develop the learning material based on the information that I find, I develop the learner guide, I develop the assessments, and I create the learning material set, which is then becomes available to you. Um, and the third leg of that is where I'm not the subject matter expert, I don't have the expertise, but I make use of the training providers staff to give me the content. So that would be two types of special development. I need more time for that. And the cost of, of course is much more than what the off the shelf is so, off the shelf stuff sitting in the library so that's cheaper stuff that needs to be me done so off that's the shelf it. is cheaper yes very much so but now the, the the i can also have multiple training providers can have the same material, the same material. Yeah. Mm. but if you if you specially develop you're going to charge extra and but that that is specifically for that provider then Yes, so that would be a category that we don't often do, but we have done that for some of the bigger companies where they want to own the IP. IP, the intellectual property. So they want the learning material to be theirs. Uh, and it's with their systems, their processes, policies, procedures within. In a case like that, my development fee is three to four times the price of what it would normally be. Because I only make the money 
on making new material when I actually have um, the material sitting in the shelf. So the third time that I sell learning material is when I start making money on a new development. So if you want your own material, own systems, everything included, then the development cost is much higher, but it can be done. And with that, I send out consultants, they work with you, we get the information from you, and it becomes your learning material, I cannot sell that again. Many things I'll do. And then the next question is the CETAS and QCTO. I'm not, I'm not going to use the, 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 someone must explain to me, but we have the CETAS, we, we, I, I think we call them the traditional qualifications. And then we have the QCTO. So what, what is the difference, I think, there between Janine and Linnell? I don't know who wants to go there. Who wants this briefly tell me? So <laughs> everyone is ducking that question. <laughs> it's, it's, what is the difference? I, I thought if you can buy material, you buy material. So now there's a, there's a difference. If, if someone can just quickly explain to me, what's the difference between the two? Does the one not, should not fit the other one? No. So I'm quite happy to jump in here because this question comes up so many times. There's a big difference between, we call it legacy qualifications, right? That's on your one leg. Legacy qualifications is your historical qualifications. They are um, designed with unit standards, your fundamental, your core, and your electives, right? So that is... That falls under the CETAS. Uh, occupational qualification doesn't have unit standards. It's got knowledge, practical, and workplace experience, which all are compulsory in order to get the occupational qualification. So it's not choose any electives to make up the combination of 120 credits. That's why there's such a big difference in the same qualification being offered um, between 30 different providers, but the electives are all different. So there is no benchmark of the same qualification. So now they've done uh, occupational qualification with all the components that is required in order to um, be, um, what, what would you say, um, competent in that occupation. So that's the difference. A lot of people don't understand that. So because there was such a big um, duplication, triplication on various qualifications that's similar, there would be 20 legacy qualifications that's similar. They trying to get rid of all the duplications and they build one specific occupational qualification that industry sits and they decide this is what the person needs in order to be competent in that job role. That's the difference. Okay, uh, many thanks, Zelda. Um, I, I'm going to ask you, a, I'm going to put you a bit on the spot there. I want to buy material. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you say if, if someone develops for the CETA, your legacy qualification, I, I can buy from the same developer also for QCTO in your experience. Do you think that the developer can just develop for both? Um, you need, you need, yeah, you do need a totally different mindset. When you develop, when we are, when we develop learning material for the QCTO, you need a totally different mindset. It's like Linnell said, the legacy qualifications was a general qualification. Sure. And you could then specialize. Let's take gen generic management four. You, or you could do all the same things for yeah. the core and the fundamental unit standards. And then you could select a specialization. Where now the QCTO is the other way around. The QCTO is specific to a job function. So as a developer, and thank goodness I have an HR background, um, I need to know what the job function is and I build from the job function, I build the learning material. So it's very much two angles that they've used yeah. to create the content or to create the curriculum, the what it must contain. Um, so it's a very different thing. Not all legacy quali quali um, developers are able to, to make that change because it's a really a mind shift change yeah. from very broad 
to now a very specific and then you build out in the QCTO qualifications. To, uh, to Linnell and Janine, your experience, we, we as the public, we go there, I want to buy material. Do, do you find that when I go to, to a developer, what type of questions you think I should ask before I can decide which one to select for occupational qualifications or legacy? Do you find that the, 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 the developers normally um, as, can, can develop both types? Or do you think that certain developers more specialize in one of them? What, what is your experience? Ezra, from my side, there's a gap in this industry. There's a huge gap. And the small training provider is trying to play in the space of the universities. You go to university, you get given a textbook. That textbook has been aligned to SACWA standards. It's been edited. It has been designed and developed by a team of authors who all have high level of communication and literacy skills. And you as a training provider, you're coming to the developers and you're going, I want to get accredited for A, B, and C, whether it's QCTO or whether it's one of the CETAs. And your expectations is that you're going to get training material that looks like one of these textbooks. So now as a material developer, so I don't know from your side or your team or Linnell, I've, I know so many material developers that have applied for various positions that we've had. And I've said to them, so, Tell me, you know, what has qualified you to be a developer? And mm -hmm. um, have you done the facilitator, the assessor, the moderator, and the design and develop training material according to SACWA unit standards? <laughs> so as I know you train that, and when developers come to me and they say, I want to be a material developer, I say, go to train you can, because go and do that course first. Don't try and start writing something that you haven't actually been taught. And we've noticed that in the industry, so many material developers are just developing. And this is not to knock people out there who are trying to make a living. I'm very pro every single person trying to make a living. But I always encourage material developers to actually just do a little bit of the background. If they haven't done the ODETP or the new training and development qualification, the practitioner's qualification with QCTO, then upskill yourself before you start developing material. From you as a training provider is, most of training providers, before they get accredited, they've written and designed their own material. They sat down and they thumb sucked it and they thought, oh no, industry needs this and they made beautiful, amazing um, guides, but they weren't taking into consideration any SACWA documents at all whatsoever. They were just designing and writing them. So then they come to us and they want to get accredited and we say, okay, well, is your material aligned? And now we're either going to refer them to Zelda or to any of the other million no. material developers out there. And the client themselves don't, don't understand the transition yeah. between training the accredited training material versus what they have been training. So they mm. go to Zelda and they buy a shelf pack and they expect it to be all this content. But then they get this and these fundamentals and they go, but we've never taught, we've been teaching Boilermaker or we've been teaching mixed farming or beauty. We never had to teach the learners numeracy, literacy and communication skills. So the transition, I think there's a huge awareness that needs to be created from non-accredited providers going to accredited, they really don't understand the bigger picture and how their training is going to change. So, so, you, you, you mentioned something very interesting there. So I'm, I'm as a client going to a developer. Now, what guidelines, what credentials could I ask for? And it's quite interesting, you, you mentioned there um, uh, the the trainer trainer or the assessor and the moderator. So yeah, that's quite that's quite interesting. So if you if you approach a developer, uh, 
I, I could ask the, what type of questions could I ask the developer before even selecting them? Because I think everyone is just going according to the price. Guys, anyone has have a question, please, if you can post it in the chat box that we can, that we can uh, pass it to. So what it's from Linnell or Zelda, say any, any other tips or guidelines when I'm approaching a developer, what should I not only looking at the price, but is there any other questions that I should ask them first? Sorry, is yes. Um, definitely is if you are um, a boilermaker running boiler making training and you're coming to a material developer, the question that you could say is the person that's writing this material or has written this material, are they a subject matter expert? So we often find material has been developed not by our subject matter experts. So that's the first one. So can I just can um, I come in here, please, Janine, if you don't mind? Um, hi, everybody. Sorry that I was late. The unit standard for um, for material development or for design and development of assessment tools as well as assessments talks to if you're not in the you, you don't have to be a, a a subject matter expert, but you have to show that you are capable of accessing or access to an SME. So I think sometimes we get confused with not confused, but we get um, we get sidetracked by saying you have to be a subject matter expert. I myself have written risk management as an example at NQF level five. My expertise does not lie in risk management, um, but it lies in general management as well as communication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The trouble is that the material developer doesn't always have the the the, nows, the, the, the skill mm. to develop the assessment according to the standard. But the content is is something that they would be able to access wherever. No, I don't agree. You don't? Okay. <laughs> <Zelda. laughs> um, the reason for me not agreeing is my expertise as a content developer lies in creating assessments based on the content and based on on yes. more specifically the requirements of either the CETA or the QCTO qualifications. So that's where my expertise line. I make use of subject matter experts to provide me the content so that I know the yes. content is current, South African, and yes. not just a copy and paste off the internet. Because that copy and paste yeah. of the internet is absolutely a killer. If you look at a criteria that says, um, well, two pieces of metal. To well, two pieces of metal, there's 50,000 websites that can give you wonderful, beautiful pictures about it. But is that the kind of metal that we have in South Africa? Is that the kind of um, welding tool that we use? Is that the mm -hmm. kind of welding environment that we work in? And is yes. that applicable to the unit standards? So. I make use of subject matter experts to actually provide me with content in all kinds of formats. You can imagine it comes with PowerPoint slides and PDFs and all kinds. And once they have provided me with that content, I then make it learning material. So yes. there's a process of making it learning material, making sure that I'm teaching the learner what they need and how to do it. So within every criteria, there's a what is it and how do I do it? And then any kind of forms or documents or tools or uh, safety that needs to be part of that criteria. So if you, if you look at the, the, the con, le, just the learner guide by itself, our learner guides are very often 80, 120, and 120 pages. I try to write the learning material in such a way that even a facilitator who does not is not an expert in the field can actually pick up the learner guide and the assessments and prepare for the training. So my job function I see is to actually make the information that is there from the subject matter expert is to make that information work and talk to the assessment criteria, whether it's QCTO or SACWA. Yeah. 
two different I different think, processes. I think also to add to, to what Celeste said, and and I think Janine also uh, uh, addressed it earlier. They, they, I think they, they're in subject matter expert, but Celeste also spoke about the learning material. Learning material is very good, but when it comes to the assessment criteria, not everything is covered. So I think that's that's come back to what what Janine earlier uh, addressed that the developer never done maybe the assessor's course before yes. and don't understand that part. So th yeah. that is maybe Janine. Um, I know you spoke about it earlier, so that is what what you said. They they have the knowledge, but they they don't have that qualification. I also just want to to uh, see. We've got another question here from Celeste. She said, "Why should SP forced to go through the uh, thing at the accreditation process when the accreditation rely heavily on material developers?" Quite quite the interesting <laughs> point. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask uh, expand on that because that that is this. It's one of these things, miracles things that I don't understand. Um, that is, yeah, well, it's a less let me not open that can of work because you hit it right on the nail there. Um, uh, no, no comment on, on, on that one because it is so. We, we evaluate the training providers' abilities against the material developers' uh, product that they produced. So um, that's also changed. The QCTO qualifications are not. The material is not verified for the QCTO qualification. What's interesting, yeah, good, very good point, no? So with the QCTO, so, there's a bit of a shift in that. Yeah, so your biggest hassle with that is, is what I am what I am seeing is three quarters of the way through training the program, the training companies would come to me and say, Zalda, please help. There is no practicals in the learning material that I bought. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I have to spend the next 20 days with these learners and I do not have practicals for, for, for this QCTO qualification. So in the QCTO qualification as the training provider, the training provider needs to provide two things. They need to provide the knowledge modules yeah. and they need to provide the practical modules. And that is either a simulation or you would have an environment. Uh, let's say you have a little store set up in your training room. Uh, to do retail training. So the learner would need to learn both the knowledge, what is merchandising, um, as well as how do I pack a shelf? And they need to be evaluated on that. And at the end of that section, they then go to the workplace to do their job. And the biggest thing here is if the content is not there for the knowledge part and the practical part, then the training provider ultimately sits with the baked apples. And the, the baked apples is literally you sitting with something mushy that's not going to work and your learners are, at the end of the day, so not going to be competent. Basically, it works itself out. It works itself out, but unfortunately, at the cost of the learner. And that is, that is always my concern. My concern is, what does the learner get out of this? So even if the training provider's facilitator is sick for the day, the learner can still carry on and do his thing because the material is set up in such a way that... The, the content is there, the assessments are there, and as long as they've got two brain cells functioning, they will be able to, to carry on. Um, and I think it is important that, that we remember them. I think all the material developers really do try to, to deliver a quality product. Some are a bit more successful than others. Some of it is in, in, in the industry for making money. The, the, mm -hmm. the pie or the cake is massive. There's, um, there's no reason to charge 50,000 Rand for a qualification, but there's also no reason to charge 2,000 Rand for a qualification, sell a million of that, and you end up with training providers that are not able to give the learners what they need or what they've paid for. So, Zelda, hmm. on the same forum where we were on, on Facebook, on the, on, the, on, the, on the Facebook, I saw somebody selling unit standards for 600 Rand. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, that, that happens. Because uh, remember what I said, me, we've developed this learning material over the last 20 odd years. So some of those unit standards were developed in 2003 and they've never been revised. So they're sitting on my computer. It's worth absolutely nothing on my computer until I sell it to you. Mm, and then there's Zelda. I guess a pain in the heart. Um, <laughs> Janine knows I've worked quite a bit with her. <laughs> 
um, I'm a stickler for the writing and I'm a stickler mm. for updating things. And I, I'm also, I have a, an OC, OCD PA who will not let anything go out without, without, <laughs> without anything being checked. So yes, yeah. he looks at the dates and goes, mm -mm, Zelda, this is more than two years old. It will not go out until you, you yeah. check it. Yeah. Or then she calls in uh, three wonderful little little characters, three old ladies who do language and grammar checking. Um, and she'll call them in and say, come on, just check everything and make sure it's all there and make sure everything's still functioning and the right colors and the right yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. Gosh, so yeah, it, it is it's possible. It's possible to sell that. You're going to sell it for a hundred rand because it already exists. Oh. Oh. So <laughs> the next uh, question to our speakers is again, I'm, I'm the customer. I want mm -hmm. to buy material. So it's my first time. Now, I know certain developers offer extra stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go into that and i think we need to divide into the the legacy qualification and the occupational qualification so with the, the three speakers the guest speakers there if i'm buying a pack so let's talk about the legacy qualifications what first only the legacy qualification what should you expect in that pack might that be unit standard or a full qualification what what is the bare minimum that when I open that zip folder, what what is for basic files that I want to see in there? Who wants to answer? Shall no, I go again? No. <laughs> <laughs> Janine, Janine. No, Zelda, go. I see Zelda <laughs> pointing to you. Um, right. So I think the the first thing that you need to be able to see is you need to see a learner guide. Now the learner guide is what is often referred to as the manual. Yeah. Okay, the learner guide has the content in it's for the learner, um, and it literally should run in or in the in the, the index of the learner guide. You should be able to see more or less. If I hold the unit center to one side, does the learner guide show me headings of a similar something? Together with the learner guide comes a facilitator guide. Facilitator guide is for my facilitator, giving them an idea of what to do when and specific instructions on on how to facilitate or ideas around that i'm not very prescriptive for the facilitator i'm sure they have these skills um as well as model answers to the class activities class activities being your formative assessments knowledge questions and an idea of how of what is required of the learner in the workplace once they go to do the practical skill or practical activities uh, so learner guide, facilitator guide. Then the, the learner should have two, one or two more items. Um, this is where as material developers we differ. Um, there should be some document in which they do activities and tasks to show that they have learned something and that they are trying it out for the first time. So these we call formative assessments. So we make use of a learner workbook. In the learner workbook, the learner has class activities. And this is where it's, it's safe for the learner to now try something. Let's say the unit stand is something like presentation skills. The formative activities will follow what the learner guide does. And at the same time, it will give the learner a chance to try out their new skills. So they would start by um, trying out how to do an introduction when you do a presentation. They would, would um, learn what the content is of the in the learner guide, they would learn what the content is of an, an actual presentation. And in the facilitator guide, they would have a safe environment in class where they would do a presentation. So all of that is recorded in the learner workbook and that is formative assessment, showing that they have learned. So learners got learner guide, learner workbook for the formative assessments, and then the learner portfolio of evidence guide. Now the POE, for short, Portfolio of Evidence Guide, is what eventually goes to the assessor to be assessed. So the Learner, learner Portfolio Guide, or POE, is there to make sure that the learner puts together enough evidence of who they are, what their background is, why they're on this training. Um, they agree to uh, 
to the assessment plan, they agree to being assessed and they haven't been forced to be there. Um, and they then have knowledge questions as well as a practical activity for the workplace uh, where they need to go and prove that they can apply the knowledge and the skills that they've learned in class. So it's, it's a document that really guides them all the way through what do they need to put together for summative assessment. Your assessor then has an assessment guide, again, very similar to the facilitator guide, which gives them model answers and guidelines and the rules for doing assessments of both formative and summative assessments. So we have learner guide, facilitator guide, learner workbook, learner POE guide, assessment guide with model answers, and the moderator guide. And the moderator guide is quite general because again, I think moderators are very specialized and very often they would have their own documents that they use from within the organization when they do a moderation. But the idea is that all of this comes together with the assessor at the end, then giving feedback, and I insist on learner on written feedback, on giving feedback to the learner you are competent or you are not yet competent, and these are the areas that are not yet competent. So there's also, I have an additional document, there's an assessor feedback document, and I actually stipulate what should be in there. Again, trying to guide the right processes according to what is required in the ODE TDP areas. So what do we have? We have a learner guide, facilitator guide with model answers. Uh, learner workbook for formative assessments, that's where the learner writes in whilst doing the training, POE guide, learner portfolio of evidence guide, being the document that the learner takes away with him and puts his evidence together to submit for assessment. We have the assessor guide with model answers and the moderator guide and an assessor feedback document that goes up and down in between the assessor and the, and the learner until they are competent. Thank you, Zelda. Um, Janine, I know you, you also deals with uh, a lot of these developers and legacy qualifications. Um, do you, do you, do you want to add onto Do you think that there's all the documents that should be in there? And then the second part of my question is, I know you deal also with a lot of developers. Um, is this always, all these things always in the back? Uh, if you can give me a percentage, if you of you talking about complaints, I see Linnell is already shaking her head. I'll, I'll, I'll get to to the Linnell a bit later on. If you if you talking about the percentage generally, because you're working with a lot of developers and a lot of training providers, so if you say percentage, how many percentage of developers of, of, of clients or training providers that bought material have these basic requirements in them when they come to you? Ezra, about 90% of our clients don't have these documents when they've bought their own material. Um, even often when they've asked us to source and they give us a budget and we source according to their budget, which is always the worst thing, people never see the value in training material. And that always makes me really sad. Even huge, big corporates, uh, big banks, etc. I always try and get them to get their own content developed because it's going to be so much better than to do a shelf thing. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, 90% of providers that come to us and they've bought their own material and we say, where's this, where's this, where's this? And they don't have it. My biggest challenge is the alignment matrix. A lot of the developers will put the alignment matrix in the assessor guide or the curriculum strategy, but often it's just not there. Um, one of my clients just spent... 75,000 Rand, buying five human standards of material. And I spoke to the company that sold it to them and I said, can I please have a model answers in the alignment matrix? No, they don't have it. They got accredited without those documents. I mean, how did that happen? I don't believe you. <laughs> so as you most of the time, I mean, when providers are buying material, because you're actually buying something that you don't know which should be in it. That's the problem. And it's the, like us babies when we buy our cars. We don't know what's under the bonnet. It just looks pretty and we buy it. So is, most providers are in the same situation. I'll get to Zelda. Now, uh, Janine, I just want to ask you another question. As I know you also deal with, you know, providers come to you for accreditation and stuff. 
generally how many I, I, I found a lot of providers get very excited when they they go on this journey to be, become an accredited training provider and the first thing that they do is they go and buy material before they even do the courses or start they buy the material uh, how often does that happen all the time they've got their material they've spent two thousand rand for a full qualification and they're so excited and then they go on the facilitator course assessor course the moderator course and then they come to us and we do our four-day capacity building as a training provider course and then they go oh my gosh my materials my material is terrible so they realize how bad their material is and then we have to source the raw material yes okay. so it happens Zelda, quick, we, we, uh, if you, you wanted to place a comment there, Zelda, many thanks, Janine. Yeah, so the alignment matrix, I didn't mention that one. The alignment matrix is probably the most important document if you're looking at um, evaluating the learning material. The alignment matrix gives you what is where in the learning material, what, how is it assessed, where is it assessed, and again, just looking at the alignment matrix, if you've done the assessor course, you know that something that's a knowledge item needs to be assessed as a knowledge question at the end. You also know that a doing task, something that starts with a verb like uh, do a presentation, weld the two pieces of metal, those are practical skills and should be assessed as a practical item. So the alignment matrix is incredibly important to tell me what is covered where and how is it assessed. Yes. Um, and I think that's the one item that generally you can just pick up as a training provider, look at the assessment criteria and look at how it's assessed. Something knowledge should be assessed with a knowledge something, with a knowledge assessment. So, so Zelda, I understand what you're saying, but can we add it maybe to Janine's previous discussion? So I could ask a training provider for a sample of the alignment matrix. Mm -hmm. And then also, if we can add that maybe on there, maybe a, a, the first page and say to him, okay, give me the first couple of assessment criteria. I just want to see how your is. So maybe that's Janine. We can also add it to your checklist. Um, mm. Quite interesting now that it comes up. And then I want to go over to Linnell. And uh, the same question I want to ask you specifically for occupational qualifications what what when when i'm i i don't know i i open the zip folder what files do i want to see there because you, you guys keep on saying there, there's a big when you work with legacy it's one hat on and the qc occupational qualifications are different so if i open that zip folder what files do i want to see on my computer hi ezra well the first thing I want to see is a learner guide, a facilitator guide, a formative assessment, a formative assessment memorandum, practical modules. I want to see um, workplace modules. I want to see a logbook. I want to see a summative assessment, a summative assessment memorandum, um, a learner workbook. And before I even look at all of that, I want to see the matrix. I want to see if the matrix is aligned to the curriculum document. And then I'm going to look if the curriculum document, the matrix document, and the learner guide has got um, a benchmark there, the page numbers, the codes, and everything else. I've rejected 53 sets of learning material that I would, re I would actually reject within two minutes. I have redone every single matrix that I have received with, facility, uh, with um, material packs for every single customer that I have ever assisted because the matrixes are so badly written. It's mm. all over the show. Um, half of the topics and elements aren't even covered. So what's important is the codes, the knowledge module codes, the topic codes. Everything is aligned because when you send your learner um, enrollment forms and your learner uploads to the QSTO, the codes are important. Um, I've got providers that buy material. I don't know what the prices is. I don't buy material whatsoever. I will evaluate it and I reject most of it all the time. I've had an ECD set of learning material where the practitioner needs to change a radiator. Like, really? 
Um, I've had a farm worker qualification where the subject matter expert had to be a, a, a qualified painter. I mean, these are the things that you have to look at when you buy material, your subject matter experts needs to go through the learning material. So it's going to cost you 20 times more to pay me to fix the, the matrix because it could take me two weeks. Um, I see matrix documents of five pages. When I'm done, it's 150 pages because I go into detail, page by page, topic by topic, because this is for the learner. If you don't cover all the topics and the elements within the curriculum in your learner guide, What's the learner going to do at the external integrated summative assessment when they're right? They're going to fail. So well, we're setting up the learner to fail. So these are the documents that I look for all the time. And yeah, I reject daily. Yeah, okay. Love it. When, when, when the nail starts with 150 pages matrix, can you guys understand why I hate, I hate development? <laughs> I, it's, development is not for me, Zelda. Don't, don't, don't even come with development close to me. It's not my forte. <laughs> now, the, 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 next, the next question I want to ask there, and, and I just want to keep it general. I know, you know everyone works differently. I'm going to buy material. And I actually want to, uh, the, the last two items address it at the same time. Now, there should be an agreement between me and the developer. Okay, I decided now I'm going to buy material. So, so what should be standard? What is the basic things? Just the one or two things that I can quickly check should be in the agreement to cover me as the client. And then now they, Linnell and Janine, uh, reject the things now. So they're not happy with the, the matrix. So whose responsibility should it be to fix it? Uh, I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> Let me go first. <laughs> I'll be <Yes>, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So um, I think the main thing is, is that when you buy learning material, you buy the right to use that learning material. The IP, the intellectual property, needs to remain with the developer. Yeah. Because remember, I'm going to resell. There's going to be another company that's going to have exactly the same material as what you have. So the first thing to look for is where does the IP lie? The second thing is as, an, as a training company or a training provider, you are buying learning material for your company. So my SLA, my service level agreement with you as a training company prevents you from reselling the learning material in any format whatsoever, right? So number one. Well, I can change sure on it. Mm-hmm. I can make some changes in it if I want to. Yes, yes. I provide it to you in a, in a MS Word and editable format so that you can add to it. Because remember, I'm also a training provider. So when I'm training AutoZone, I want to put their policies and procedures in there, certain steps that they do differently for health and safety, for instance. So I want to be able to edit it. So, and when I then train PG Glass, it's quite a different client, different standards, so, different so, everything. So, so my that, SLA, so, 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 so before you carry on, you, you talk about the format, uh, MS Word format. So I want to, to get it in an editable uh, Microsoft Word document that I can edit it. Correct. And that's how I provide it to you. Okay. Not a PDF that is standard and I just print, then I'm, then I'm just training for bums on seats. I, I prefer my training providers to want to give quality. Okay. So in the SLA, it's about the IP, where does that reside? Number two is I'm s signing a contract with you as a training provider. So I, there must be somewhere where your company registration documents and my company registration document numbers, just the numbers for that, goes into. So it's a legal agreement amongst us. Um, also, the, the service level agreement must state exactly what am I giving you. So am I giving you unit standards or qualifications or integrated material where you know, standards have been put together in programs. Um, so it must state, what am I giving you? And also, I think very importantly, and that is, who does all the fixes? Right? So what sometimes so does a, happen? Zelda, there's a clause in the agreement to say who's fixing what. Exactly. 
And with us, the fixing remains with us. Because remember, I want to be able to resell the material. And I want to also be able to, to, to give it a better quality product at the end of the day. So I need to learn from the errors. I need to learn from the fixes. Okay. So with us, we guarantee um, that we will change the learning material according to what the verifier requires. So the, and we specify that. We specify the CETA verifier. For QCTO, we've, take, we've, we've changed that to just the verifier. I don't want just feedback from the facilitator. I don't like the picture on page four. I'm not going to change anything for that. But if it's legitimate and it, it's something like Lin, Linnell was talking about, um, where it's the, the matrix is not correct, give me input. Let me learn as well. It's the only way I get feedback. And in order for me to improve my product, I do need feedback. So, Zelda, can you just quickly summarize those things again there? Mm -hmm. you, you, just quickly, the, the, the key things that should be in the contract. The key things is um, make sure it's a le legitimate company that I'm dealing with, mm -hmm. right? So re company registration numbers, a legal contract needs to have company to company details. Mm -hmm. So company details, where does the IP lie? In other words, can I resell the learning material? Yes or no. Thirdly, it must specify exactly what am I buying? And fourthly, who's responsible for the fixes? Perfect. Then I just want to quickly, uh, I know we lost uh, Janine there. Linnell, if you, if, you, if you have to, I know you, you're working mostly with occupational qualifications. And if you have to 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 say, I, I know we spoke about the matrix. We said a lot of problems comes from the matrix. But do you have a do you think there's a, a big problem with people who purchase material and then can't get the developers to fix these things for them? Um, how big is the problem? If I if I may ask you again, Israel, um, with the clients I serve. So it's, it's not um, general. This is um, what I do. When I see the matrix, um, I will feel extremely ill. I'll put it in a folder that says, do not use in capital letters. And then I will redo it for the client because I don't have the time yeah. to, um, to actually train a developer yeah. how to use the curriculum. That's number one. The curriculum is the national standard of the occupational qualification. It's not a legacy qualification. Then I go further and I, I might write a four page document in recommendations of what's missing um, on the learning material. And I will give this to my client. My client then deals with the developer. I don't. Because I will kill do, them. Do you do? Do you find a lot of a lot of uh, uh, how many? If you must put it in the percentage, how many of the developers who sell material is willing to go back and you know do alterations and stuff? Just in your opinion, from your experience, thirty percent of them are willing to fix it at no additional cost to the to the provider. Yeah. Um, where others will say, well, go and buy something else. We're not fixing it. Okay, so if I pay 500 rand for a qualification, I can't expect the developer then to, to make any changes for that 500 rand. <laughs> so, Absolutely not. I mean, you, you also have to look at um, if, if you buy material, let's say it's 8,000 rand for a qualification that's 120 uh, credits, but it's a generic qualification. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I would expect the developer to, to fix it. And the next set of material that gets sold will be the fixed material yeah. in any way. So yeah. we, I'm actually helping the developer, um, not directly, but through the client because the client pays for the material. I don't yeah. because I know if I have to buy it, I have to sit with a developer and explain to them, you missed 80% of the content. Um, no, so it's 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 very it's very bad. The QSTO already gives you an example of what they want to see in the matrix, so it's spoon feeding, and they can't even get that right. 
So it's 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 bad. It's very bad. And I can tell you on the site visit, the the matrix and the learning material is so important because if you don't know that your module um, two topic five doesn't um, doesn't correspond with your matrix, it means you haven't gone through it. And now you must go and find where's the content and it becomes a problem because you're yeah. the expert, you want to offer that qualification. Are you really ready to offer this and be accredited for it? I don't think so. so that's the, the contract part is very interesting to make sure when I buy material, what is standing in there. Uh, guys, I, I know we have still a lot of questions for for these people and we will post this video on our website and on YouTube and I will also post the contact details of our guest speaker so you're more than welcome to contact them directly if you have another question. I just want to go here, Eureka, you ask in the chat, hi uh, everyone, is uh, ISO 900, what, 9001 international standard learning material the same as CETA or QCT approved learning material or is this okay I see there's heads there that's standing there. <laughs> who wants to Linnell or uh, um, uh, Zelda who wants to just a, a quick um, comment on that yeah the the ISO standards are, are something totally different it's a quality management system standard um, and it's got nothing to do with the CETA and the QCTO qualification learning material not at all. Um, uh, the ISO standards are for international grading as far as quality is concerned and learning material or learning material for the seats in the QCTO does not fit into that quality management category. Um, at the same time of saying that when you are looking at doing, and I'm going to open a nest now, when you are looking at doing e-learning, very often your e-learning system and the system that you implement needs to be of a certain quality and that's where your ISO standards would come in as to my system needs to do one, two, three, four, otherwise it's not compliant to my ISO standards, my quality management system. But it's an ISO quality management system, not the QMS that we refer to when we talk about learning material and training. It's a totally separate system. Okay, then you pretty ask a question here. Does the facilitator have to make his model answers for the summative assessments? Or because I say they never got it. Okay, the facilitator, I would say, is working with the formatives. So they, 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 the, the facilitator should get model answers for the formatives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, summatives, I know, I think Zelda, you spoke about it earlier. Should you get the model answers for your summatives also? That's a yes and no. It's very much um, how much do I trust my facilitator and is my facilitator going to be the support person for my learner once they go back to the workplace to do their summative assessments, their workplace application. Okay, so my so facilitator you, is that person. Sorry, Zelda. So, so quite into, uh, uh, so the, the, I think they just wanted to know if you buy a pack, but you've got a quite interesting answer there. So should your facilitator get the model answers for the summative you say that facilitator could give the model answers to the learners. <laughs> that also happens. <laughs> so, that, that is what, and so unless it's the same person, you shouldn't give your summative model answers to the facilitator. Quite I, I wouldn't say that. You've, you've, got to, you've got to work from a point of trust. Yeah. Um, my facilitators and my assessors and my moderators are people that I trust with absolutely everything. I trust that they will not be giving the, mo the model yeah. answers of the knowledge questions, which is the summative assessment of knowledge. I trust that they will not be giving that to the actual learner. Um, and your, if your assist assessor is awake, they will quickly see by the yeah. third portfolio that they're marking that, hang on, everybody's got the same answers. So something's gone wrong here. And then it's an internal process on your side to fix it. But yes, um, whether the, they get it or don't get it, that's really up to the up to the training provider. We provide it. Perfect. Many, many thanks, Guy. And we're getting to the end of our talkie block. Once again, I want to say many, many thanks there to Zelda for your time again today. Uh, thank you for all the input. Uh, Linnell, again, many, many, many thanks. And also for Janine. 
Nou, toen 